welcome to the ICAEW Insights podcast, where we analyze the latest news from the world of accountancy, business, and finance. I'm Philippa Kelly, Director of Financial Services at ICAEW, and I'm pleased to be hosting this episode where we look at issues facing charities in the UK, the increasing focus of regulators, investors, and stakeholders on non-financial misconduct, and what's new with tax. I'm joined by Christina Kopik, Head of Charity and Voluntary Sector at ICAW, Nikesh Pandit, Barrister at 4 to 5 Grays Inn Square and Financial Services Faculty Board Member. And welcome back to Lindsay Wicks, Technical Editor of Tax at ICAEW. First, let's look at charities. The past two years have been incredibly difficult for many charities, both in terms of being able to operate sustainably, but also in terms of their ability to support users at a time when they've never been more needed. The government is reviewing its guidance to the sector this month, which will be of particular interest to trustees. As well as the difficulties due to the pandemic, charities face continuing challenges in access to banking and many other issues. Christina, what do you see as the biggest challenge for charities in 2022 and beyond? First of all, to say that a lot of the challenges that charities face are quite similar to those challenges of other sectors. So, for example, increased energy bills, remote service delivery, protecting themselves against fraud and cybercrime. And also, I think particularly topical at the moment is um, trying to recruit and retain talent in this very competitive labor market. But two of the challenges that I just wanted to draw out a bit more because I think they're particularly relevant for charities. Uh, firstly, a challenge of raising enough unrestricted funds to invest into the charity's infrastructure. And that is really important for charities because that is funding for vital functions such as finance, IT and HR. And if you think about what happened during the pandemic and the ways of working, finance was really crucial in terms of cash flow, forecasting and, and monitoring the Charities' income streams and IT and HR were really important um, to manage the digital um, transformation, also the changed ways of working. So unrestricted funds are particularly important for charities to make sure that they can deliver on their charitable objectives. The other challenge I wanted to mention was um, that charities need to always reflect on how they can best meet their objectives and maximize impact. So, for example, you would have seen that most charities would have had increased demand as a result of the pandemic. And that makes sense because if you think about why charities are set up, it is often to address a social problem and to reduce social inequalities. So with the pandemic widening those gaps between the rich and the poor, both um, nationally and internationally, there is a much higher demand for charities. And charities need to revisit their core purpose and look at their strategy and see whether their theory of change still makes sense in this changed environment. And quite often that relies on collaboration. So charities cannot solve all of those problems themselves, um, not even in collaboration with other charities and other sectors. Um, quite often what is needed is a system change and, and that relies on charities working really effectively with government to influence policy. And um, we have our charity conference virtually this week, um, at the end of this week. And we have um, the chief executive from Pro Bono Economics joining us at the conference. And he will talk about the role of civil society in the UK's post-pandemic renewal agenda. Um, so I think that will be a really interesting session for all of those charities and all our members who are interested in working a little bit more with government and influencing policy. So a huge number of challenges there this year, and as you say, not not unlike those faced by other businesses. But for ICAW members who either work in or with charities, what do they need to be particularly aware of at the moment? Yeah, I think there's a number of things, and I'll, I'll take it in two parts. So I'll talk first about our members who work in senior finance role within charities, and I'll, then I'll talk about the practitioners. Um, so in the context of what I was just talking about, about charities having to adapt their strategy, having to collaborate more and adapt their working practices and the way they deliver their services, that all means that finance professionals who work within charities will also need to look again at the way they budget and the way they measure their own performance, particularly in the sense of um, collaborating with other charities and other organizations and seeing um, how they perform within that. 
Um, what we've also seen as a result of the pandemic is that a lot of charities had a really big impact on their reserves and that could have gone in, in either direction. So some charities had to use up their reserves or use up part of their reserves just to stay alive during the pandemic, whereas other charities found themselves in quite a counterintuitive position of having actually more cash than before because they were able to access emergency grants and government funding and had to explain in their reserves policy why suddenly they appeared richer on paper, which was really only a short-term situation. So, so many charities, they might still have quite a simplistic model for their reserves policy, for example, having three to six months' worth of expenditure in their free reserves, but actually a more sophisticated approach might be more suitable, and that approach might take into account um, things like income risk, working capital requirements, investing in new opportunities or protecting themselves with a rainy day fund. So that all requires a much deeper understanding of the charity's business model and the risk associated with the different income streams. And our members are really well placed in helping trustee boards to understand that. And they can also explain the interlink between strategy, risk management and reserves policies. I also wanted to talk about our members working in practice because I think they really fulfill a very crucial role in helping charities win public trust by providing high quality audits and independent examinations. And in our members who advise charities um, on how to write a really well-considered annual report and demonstrate their impact, they also have an impact indirectly on helping charities to access grant funding and also restore the confidence in the charity sector, which is really important for charities to access donations from individuals. So how can members from other sectors help to support charities through these challenging times? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually, I think our members are absolutely fantastic in that area because we know that over 20,000 of our members hold a board level voluntary role. So they might be charity trustees or even have a special office such as honorary treasurer or chair of a trustee board. And that is so valuable to charity trustees, um, trustee boards, because they bring that expertise to the rest of the board and really help charities plan their finances and become more and more financially sustainable. And at ICAW, we really want to support that and encourage anyone, even at the start of their career, to consider becoming a trustee. So in, in order to support our, our members, we've launched our free trustee training module. So they are free for absolutely everyone. And so our members can share that with their trustee network um, to raise the competence and the level of understanding of the responsibilities of trustees. We also have a volunteering community um, which provides regular updates to our members and webinars and training. And finally, I also want to mention our website ICAW Volunteers because this is a website that really brings together finance professionals with charities that look for skilled volunteers. So it's a site where anyone can look up um, volunteering opportunities and quite often they look specifically for, for finance professionals, whether that be as a trustee, as a treasurer or on a more time-limited project. So for anyone interested in becoming a volunteer of any, any kind of volunteering, I strongly recommend having a look. And I'm sure, Philippa, we can leave the links to those resources in the notes to the podcast to make it really easy for people to have a look at the resources that we provide and also um, to join our cha charity conference if they would like to. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Christina. And we will indeed have the link to ICW volunteers, the community and the other resources that Christina mentioned in the show notes to this episode. Over the last few years, the Financial Conduct Authority has increased its focus on non-financial misconduct. The regulator holds that a culture where non-financial misconduct is tolerated is not healthy, it's not safe, and it's not acceptable. Individuals have also been banned from working in the financial services industry for non-financial misconduct. But what is non-financial misconduct, and what are the parallels for chartered accountants? Nikesh Pandet is here to explain all this. Hi, Nikesh. Hi, Philippa. Thank you very much for having me on. Are you seeing an increase in focus on non-financial misconduct in the financial services industry and other professions? I think the short answer is yes. But to really get under the bonnet of that question, I think 
the starting point is to to understand the type of conduct that falls within the term non-financial misconduct and the term really includes personal bis- misbehavior such as sexual misconduct sexual harassment discrimination and bullying that's committed either inside the workplace or indeed outside the workplace and i think the recent focus has been um, on conduct largely relating to integrity rather than financial dishonesty and looking at that kind of conduct conduct we're absolutely seeing an increase in focus taking the fca the sort of the recent focus has probably kicked off in proper in say september 2018 where uh, megan butler who was then the fca's executive director for supervision responded to um, a house of commons paper on sexual harassment where she said in terms that sexual harassment and other forms of non-financial misconduct can amount to a breach of the fca's conduct rules which include the requirement to act with integrity. That was then followed up in December 2018 by the FCA's Christopher Woolard, who is then the Executive Director of Strategy and Competition. He gave a speech where he said, non-financial misconduct is misconduct, plain and simple. So we have these sort of high-level statements by the FCA, but that's also translated into real outcomes. The FCA announced that it had prohibited three individuals from working in financial services on the basis of sexual offences. The FCA said that those individuals were not fit and proper because each of them lacked the necessary integrity and reputation to work in the regulated financial services sector and it considered um, a prohibition order to be appropriate in order to advance the FCA's consumer protection and integrity objectives. And then more recently, in August 2021, we've had the Upper Tribunal issue a decision really going to the heart of non-financial misconduct in the case of Frensham. Again, this was a, a case involving a sexual offence. Mr Frensham was a um, an independent financial advisor and FCA-approved person. And in March 2017, he was convicted of attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming And he committed this offence whilst he was an approved person and on bail for a similar offence. And he received a suspended sentence. Um, The FCA found that Mr Frensham was not a fit and proper person to perform any function in relation to any regulated activity because he lacked the necessary integrity and reputation. And the grounds for that finding were quite interesting, uh, especially um, how the um, upper tribunal interpreted it. Because the upper tribunal said that the prohibition was justified not solely on the basis of the conviction, but it was the conviction coupled with the fact um, that Mr Frensham had failed in his obligation to be open and transparent with the regulator. So it was quite an interesting decision where I think the upper tribunal said when looking purely at the circumstances around the conviction was not enough in this case, but when that coupled with the issues around being open and transparent, that sort of took the case over the line to justify the prohibition. Really, the upper tribunal's decision in this uh, was quite interesting because what they did find is that the FCA could have probably conducted its case more thoroughly. And in particular, they felt that um, the case would have benefited from more criminological and psychological evidence to support the view that Mr Frencham's offence actually created a significant risk that he would... uh, you know, in a likewise manner, seek to exploit vulnerable clients such as the elderly. We may well see the FCA perhaps um, requiring um, or producing more expert evidence, and we also might see the FCA perhaps going um, after non-financial misconduct that doesn't necessarily relate to um, sexual offences. And indeed, it may well be easier to find a link between an individual's lack of personal integrity and lack of professional integrity in cases not involving sexual misconduct. For instance, you could have an issue around bullying in the personal setting where someone engages in that sort of misconduct because they respond badly to criticism. Um, And that could be something that links more directly, say, into an issue in the um, professional setting. So I think that's where the sort of the FCA is going in this particular issue around more evidence on um, from a psychological and criminological perspective to justify the link between a lack of 
personal integrity and professional integrity. This is clearly something that the regulator is is paying more attention to, but we're also seeing developments within the professions as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the profession probably most of interest here might be the ICAEW. And I think we've absolutely seen action by the ICAW. Firstly, there's been um, guidance in this area. Um, We've had the guidance on boundaries of personal and professional life and ethics that was issued by the CCAB, so the Consultative Committee of Accountancy Bodies, which of course includes the ICAW. And we've had, uh, beyond the guidance, um, some real outcomes too. If I could just take the um, ICAW's December 2021 disciplinary update, there were two cases involving non-financial misconduct. So the first case was the tribunal of the disciplinary committee severely reprimanded a member and fined him £5,000 and required him to pay costs um, for using his corporate mobile phone to make excessive and inappropriate personal phone calls to a premium rate line. And another case that was in the December 2021 disciplinary update um, related to a partner in a firm who was severely reprimanded and fined £7,000 and required to pay costs because he um, acted um, inappropriately uh, towards an employee who was completing her training contract in that he used language of a sexual nature whilst at lunch on a skiing holiday organised for employees of the firm. And then shortly after that lunch, whilst having drinks with colleagues, he again used language of a sexual nature directed at the trainee um, in circumstances where he knew or ought to have known that such conduct was not wanted or invited. And in this case, um, the tribunal seriously considered excluding that individual from the profession, but decided that a reprimand and financial penalty would be um, a sufficient base. So these two cases alone from the December 2021 update, plus the guidance, I think shows that professions as well as the um, FCA um, are really active in this area. So as you say, the the regulator is increasingly active here. The professions are taking this very seriously. And from the cases you've talked about, it, it feels like we are starting to see those examples come through. I suppose the average person might think, oh, well, that's actually, that's quite clear cut in terms of some of the offences that that you've talked about. But what does this mean for the average professional and and how should we translate this this increase and and this concern into our professional lives? I suppose taking the sort of the first sort of side of the question, just the individual alone, I think one of the things that we'll definitely be seeing and probably increasing as more decisions are published by the regulators and the professions is it's just individuals acting more mindful about non-financial misconduct or potential non-financial misconduct both inside and outside of of work and I think the whole inside outside work is quite interesting at the moment because obviously due to COVID a lot more of us are working from home and those boundaries between work and home are, are blurred and you can certainly see a scenario where somebody is um, at work, at home, but they also um, might have um, their personal laptop near them or a personal phone and they go on Twitter or another form of social media and they say something or get involved in some sort of debate and suddenly they're essentially putting stuff out there on their employer's time um, that sort of narrows the the gap between what is um conduct that happened in a personal capacity and conduct that happened um, at work. I think individuals um, will also uh, want to remind themselves of relevant policies and procedures at work in this area. And that's not just um, around um, diversity and inclusion, but, you know, social media policies, whistleblowing policies and reporting obligations. Um, I think um, as regulators uh, um, grapple more with this area, there will be more guidance. And I think it's a duty of regulated professionals to keep on top of that guidance. And it's not just something that they should, you know, wait for their employers to sort of put out there. I think that there's a real need to to stay on top of uh, matters that are coming out from the regulator yourself, if you're, if you're a regulated professional. And then what I think will also be quite interesting is, given the way um, and, and the guidance that came out of Frensham, 
I think there is more of an avenue now to push back as well if if you are facing these kinds of allegations where you know individuals can say look I did do this this did call into question my personal integrity but what is the link to to my professional integrity so I think that's the sort of the piece around individuals from an organizational perspective I think we're definitely going to see employers ramping up their systems and controls in this area pushing training I think we will also see more investigatory steps a part of the regulatory obligation on employers is to to figure out whether something falls within something that um, the regulator should be made aware of. So, so I think people should certainly expect to see their firms perhaps, you know, taking more um, immediate steps around um, this sort of conduct when it comes to sort of internal investigations. And the interesting piece on the sort of organisational front will be how do different firms um, approach it? I think we'll see some firms potentially taking quite a, a strong line on this and and perhaps even a sort of uh, almost defensive line where they rule out social functions they may indeed um, you know have postponed Christmas events and things like that due to COVID and, and now they're thinking of well perhaps you know we should you know reschedule these events and they might do them in a different way because of the concerns that are coming out from the professions and and the regulators. The interesting thing around the response and whether employers take a sort of zero risk approach is that there really is a, is a concern that if you start ceasing events at a firm level then people may um, you know break off into their little groups and you can see sort of the re-emergence or further entrenchment of, um, of sort of old boy networks um, and and sort of cozy clubs and of course those sorts of um, you know facets of, of corporate life are not necessarily conducive to um, equality and diversity and creating healthy cultures as well. So employers may well end up in a sort of a tricky scenario where on the one hand they want to limit their risk, uh, but equally the solution that they think uh, will limit the risk may indeed um, sort of lead to some pretty bad outcomes in terms of, sort of the, the, the bigger equality and diversity picture. It's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? And as you've touched on that, diversity and inclusion agenda is is very present um, with the regulators at the moment. We've seen the, the recent consultations in that regard. And as the financial services industry and indeed also the accountancy profession move to become more diverse and inclusive, what role does cracking down on non-financial misconduct play in that? Well, I think there's probably two sort of key areas. The first is is, is signalling. It really shows that the financial services industry, the accountancy profession takes a, a strong line against conduct such as racism and, and sexual harassment. And I think hopefully, you know, that strong line will, will show people who are you know, considering joining the financial services profession that, you know, this might be a profession that they can can feel comfortable in. And indeed, people who are who are in the profession, they can see that, you know, this is a profession I can stay in uh, because my regulator, um, and my professional body is taking a, a hard line on these things and, and they want me to, to feel comfortable. Um, the other big area is around culture. So the FCA, I think, very much takes the view that tolerance of non-financial misconduct um, is a driver of, of poor culture. Effectively, if you tolerate something like sexual harassment, then you're creating an environment which um, will essentially not encourage people to speak up, to be heard, to challenge decisions. And that can really lead to, to poor outcomes. Firstly, in terms of, 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 of social justice, where I think the FCA wants to see an environment where people have the chance to speak out no matter what their protected ca characteristics are, that they can say their piece that they can contribute to ideas and as a result of that they can um, sort of further themselves within their organizations so I think there's a sort of a social justice side to it that you want to create cultures where people can speak up and because of that sort of speaking up they can get on within their institutions and I think there's also a, um, a sort of customer outcome side to this as well where the thinking is is that if you have 
a diverse group of people contributing ideas that people are not scared to contribute, um, then that will lead to diverse output and we will have um, more diverse uh, ideas and products um, that will hopefully better cater for the diverse society that um, financial services is there to um, serve. Thank you very much, Nikesh. Now, I'd like to welcome back Lindsay Wicks, ICAW's technical editor for tax, to discuss some of the hot topics in tax as we start off 2022. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Philippa. Good so, to be here. So we've been talking about misconduct, which is also particularly relevant for tax professionals to be considering at this time of year. Could you tell us a little bit about the recent briefing from HMRC in this area? Yeah, as you mentioned, um, HMRC has issued a briefing setting out its approach to tax fraud. And this time of year, where it's a very busy time of the self-assessment season, the role of tax professionals is really to help taxpayers get their tax filings correct. In HMRC's briefing, um, it set out its steps for preventing fraud happening in the first place. And HMRC's approach is to build checks and controls into its systems, to make legislative changes to make it harder to commit fraud in the first place, and to work with businesses to help them to spot where they're at risk. And that final point is really where um, tax professionals can also be helping out. ICAW and other professional bodies and associations have set out some guidance. So we've talked a lot about professional guidance and conduct. So for tax, the guidance is the professional conduct in relation to taxation. And for short, that is PCRT. PCRT is useful when discussing complex filing and positions with taxpayers at this time of year. And then alongside the main bit of guidance, there's also help sheets on submission of tax information and tax filings, provision of tax advice, dealing with errors, so that links in with fraud potentially, and handling requests for data from HMRC. And many of these help sheets contain some really practical flowcharts setting out actions and considerations when dealing with various situations. So these flowcharts might help you decide whether or not actually you need to cease acting for a client, whether you need to make a report to your money laundering reporting officer, all those kinds of practical tips. So going back to um, HMRC and when there is tax fraud, um, so it'll generally try to investigate fraud using its civil powers. But in serious cases, it does have criminal powers available. So in England and Wales, the relevant bit of legislation would be the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. So civil investigations will either be conducted under Code of Practice 8 or Code of Practice 9. And when HMRC issues its letter, it'll say what um, code of practice it's applying. So Code of Practice 8 doesn't involve any allegation of fraud at the outset. HMRC will use Code of Practice 9 where fraud is suspected. But when taxpayers receive the initial letter, HMRC won't set out the nature of its suspicions. To avoid going down the criminal route, um, taxpayers are invited to make a full disclosure. And if they do so, then this is followed up by them engaging a professional to make a full report. And this is something, again, that ICAW members might get involved in doing. These cases need to be handled with real care. If any subsequent admissions come to light, then HMRC reserves the right to use its criminal powers. So it's one of those areas where specialist knowledge is required to guide taxpayers through the process. Absolutely. So moving away from fraud, there's also been some other high profile announcements, hopefully of a more administrative nature. What do members need to know about self-assessment deadlines? Well, like last January, HMRC hasn't changed the 31st of January filing and payment deadline for self-assessment, but it has provided a delay on when it's going to charge penalties for late filing and for late payment. Now, this is just a penalty waiver, so interest will still apply on unpaid tax from the 1st of February, and the current rate of interest is 2.75% on late paid tax. Also, if taxpayers um, do file after the 31st of January, 
these tax returns will be treated as late, which means that the window that HMRC has to inquire into the return is also extended. So to avoid penalties, um, first of all, returns have got to be filed by the 28th of February to avoid a £100 late filing penalty. So that's the initial penalty that's applied for a late return. And then normally a 5% late payment penalty is charged on the 2nd of March. And um, this year, the late payment penalty will apply if tax hasn't been paid by the 1st of April or if a time to pay arrangement hasn't been set up by the 1st of April. So this is where taxpayers have got difficulty paying and they agree with HMRC. They can do this under a self-serve arrangement if the liability is less than £30,000 or if they need a bigger facility, then they need to arrange that with HMRC by the 1st of April to avoid the 5% late payment penalty. Many reasons to mark April Fool's Day in the diary then. There are, yeah. There's a few other complexities around these extensions. So um, self-employed taxpayers may also need to pay their Class 2 national insurance liability separately by the 31st of January if they want to claim contributions-based allowances such as employment and support allowance. There's quite a few of these other practicalities where um, we're going to be issuing some more guidance um, that has been agreed with HMRC over the next few days, so look out for that. No, we will do, and all guidance that we've mentioned today will be available in the show notes. So we've also seen some changes to statutory sick pay, Lindsay, and some interesting approaches being taken by companies here. Yeah, that's very true. Um, Statutory sick pay has been a key issue since the start of the pandemic, and um, statutory sick pay isn't normally a government-funded benefit. It's just a statutory minimum that employers have to pay to qualifying employees. And many employers pay more than this minimum. So normally there's a three day wait before statutory sick pay is payable. But at the start of the pandemic, this was suspended because the government wanted people to isolate to curb the spread of coronavirus. Then as this pushed up the cost for small employers, the statutory sick pay rebate scheme was introduced. Now, this scheme ended on the 30th of September at the same time as the coronavirus job retention scheme. As we know, just before Christmas, we saw case rates going through the roof again. Um, So it was announced that the statutory sick pay rebate scheme would be introduced for small employers for absence from the 21st of December 2021. Now, employers that are eligible to claim a rebate of statutory sick pay, they've got to be UK based. They've got to have less than 250 employees on the 30th of November 2021. They've got to have a PAYE scheme in place at the 30th of November 2021 and they've got to be paying COVID-related statutory sick pay. Now, these small employers can claim up to two weeks of COVID-related statutory sick pay per employee and the two-week period is reset from the 21st of December 2021. So if they'd claimed under the first iteration of the rebate scheme, they can claim again for the same employees um, under this new iteration. So another change to statutory sick pay that happened back in December um, was a change to self-certification period. Normally, employees can self-certify the first seven days of sickness absence. But as we know, there was a big push to deliver boosters in the run up to Christmas and to free up um, GP capacity to deliver the booster programme. The self-certification period has been increased to 28 days and that's for absences beginning on or after the 10th of December 2021 and beginning on or before the 26th of January 2022. Now these are all the government changes but as you mentioned some employers have also decided to change their policies about when they pay more than the statutory minimum. Thank you Lindsay that's all really useful for the businesses to know. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. My thanks to all our guests, Christina Kopik, Mikesh Pandit and Lindsay Wicks. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you'll tune in next time. Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to hear more from ICAEW, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.